Hey everyone, Henry Arslanian here and welcome to the special episode of the Future Money Podcast. The episode today is quite a special one. It's with the co-founder of Three Arrow Capital, Kyle Davis. Uh, I need to give a better background to this episode. About a week ago, Kyle reached out and asked if he can come on the show on the Future Money Podcast uh, to share about this latest crypto venture. Uh, initially, I was quite hesitant. Uh, I know uh, he's quite a controversial figure in the crypto community. Uh, he's quite a controversial figure in the crypto community. Many people believe that he's a fraud, that he misled investors, uh, that frankly, that he should not be given another chance. Uh, on the other hand, I know that many of you listeners uh, would be keen to hear from him, hear his point of view and hear what he has to say. So after quite reflection, uh, I decided to have him on the show, uh, but I agreed with Kyle that there'll be a couple of conditions. Uh, one of, first of all, uh, we wouldn't need to disclose where he is physically right now. Uh, second, that I could ask any question that I want. Uh, and if there's a, any question that he does not need to answer, uh, he, does not, he does not need to answer them uh, for any legal reasons. Uh, as you will see in the podcast, uh, that didn't happen. Uh, but also that third and very importantly, that we will be able, I will be able to ask any question that I want uh, on the Three Arrows debacle, on OpenX, and, if, if, and now on his new venture, um, you know, uh, Ox.Fund. I think it was a very interesting uh, episode. This is the f his first one-on-one -on -one interview that he has, been, that has given in over a year. Uh, so I think uh, not many of us have heard of him in the last couple of months. And I think it was interesting to hear his insights. Um, hope you like this episode. I know it's a very controversial one. Uh, but And I asked him a lot of questions that I think you as, as listeners may have as well. Uh, I found it very, I found his answers in the episode overall very insightful and hope uh, you find it as interested, uh, as interesting and as insightful as I did. Thank you very much, everybody, and hope you enjoyed this episode of the Future Money Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm your host, Henry Arslanian, and welcome to this special episode of the Future Money Podcast. Uh, the episode today is a bit different from the ones we regularly have. Uh, we, we're, we're joined today by Kyle Davis, the former uh, co-founder of Three Hours Capital, who's joining us uh, from, a, I think, undisclosed uh, location in Europe. Kyle, good to have you with us on the show on the Future Money, uh, on this special episode of the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Henry. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Kyle, so as we're recording this today, it's uh, February 26th, 2024. Uh, you know, maybe to set the scene for our audience, uh, you reached out to me last week, wanted to come on the show. Uh, and as I told you, I was initially a bit hesitant uh, on on having you. As you you know very well, you're kind of a polarizing figure in the crypto community uh, with everything that happened at 3AC, OpenX. Uh, but, you know, I think the uh, just knowing my audience, I've been doing this podcast now since 2016. And uh, as you know, my, I have a half a million followers. Who, who, many of them are actually quite active in crypto. And I think they would uh, they would appreciate hearing your point of view and hearing First of all, from you, I understand this is the first one-on-one -on -one interview you've been doing in over a year. Uh, so I think a lot of the, my audience has probably not heard from you, and they would probably benefit uh, from uh, some questions I may have for you that I'm sure many of them would have. And set, set the scene as well, Kyle. Uh, obviously, as we discussed in the past, uh, in the past last week when we agreed to this episode, uh, basically I can ask anything that I want. Of course, of course, you don't need to disclose where you are, uh, but you have the right to any any questions you don't want to answer because of any ongoing litigation or such matters. You can just turn it down. And uh, the way I want to structure this conversation is discuss initially, obviously, kind of the three arrows. Now that we're you know eighteen months. Uh, you know, uh, after the fact, after what everything that happened, discuss OpenX as well, and also discuss some of the the new venture uh, Ox Fund uh, that you're doing as well. Uh, and uh, that I want to hear, I think, uh, hear more about it as well. Does that uh, sound like a plan of a plan of action for the next uh, couple of minutes? That sounds like a plan. I don't know if we have enough time. This might be like a five hour episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll try to uh, keep it short and uh, get, get to the point. But uh, all right. I think there's a lot of talk questions I'm sure the audience has. First of all, uh, Kyle, I mean, it's been now, made to kick it off. It's been like 18 months now to the, uh, the Three Arrows uh, debit, debit, debit call, if you want, and everything that happened afterwards. I mean, how, how do you feel now that, you know, 18 months has passed? Uh, how is how Kyle Davis? Henry, I feel, I feel awesome. Uh, <laughs> we, I think people forget, but uh, Three Arrows was a 10-year fund. Uh, I started it in uh, 2012 with uh, Sue, 
And we had gone to high school together. We had gone to college together. We started this company when we were about 24 years old. And we were two kids in a, in a room and, uh, you know, and, and grew it had a, like a pretty wild 10 year period of success after success in various asset classes. And then, you know, the last month was pretty rocky, but how do I feel? I feel great. I feel great. We've been doing lots of stuff in the past uh, 18 months. There's, I've, I've done things that I, I, you know, I've wanted to do that I've never been able to do before. Read books that I've, uh, you know, learned a couple languages that I've always wanted to learn. I mean, it's been great. Well, what are what are the languages you started learning post uh, 3IC? Well, I was in uh, Bali for a bit, so I learned some Bahasa. Uh, I had studied Japanese for like 10 years as a kid, mm -hmm. but I was yeah. a little bit rusty, and so I spent a bunch of time in a rural part of Japan, which was quite fun because I had always been in cities before. Um, but this time around, I really wanted to see, you know, uh, a different side of Japan. And that was amazing. It, it re reminded me of, uh, you know, kind of middle school and high, high school years studying Japanese. And then, uh, yeah, and then I spent a bunch of time in Europe as well. So kind of, kind of all over the place, like a bunch of stuff that I had never been able to do before. And what's your favorite book that you read during this time? You mentioned you read a couple of books. Oh, well, okay. It went through like a series. Like I think my, my first two books that I read um, were Herman Hesse's, uh, you know, Siddhartha and uh, Dimian. And these are books that you probably read in like middle school or high school or whatever. Mm -hmm. You don't really think that much about them, but they're really about journeys. And uh, yeah, and they're, 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 they're really interesting. Like the, the general gist of Dimian is like, you know, that your whole life you are learn about the upside. In school, you're, you're you're training for the upside. When you do a business, you start. You're always training for the upside. But in Zimian, they he explains. Well, actually, you know, what if God represents the upside and the downside, and you can appreciate all of that. And that that actually, it, I, it was one of the first books. I mean, it was one of the first two books that I read that was really interesting. And then, of course, Siddhartha, the journey, uh, as well, was very interesting. But yeah, I, I went through those. I'm a big uh, Ernest Hemingway fan. Pretty much went through all of those. Uh, you know, um, Farewell to Arms is my favorite book that he has, but I read that and The Sun Also Rises and, um, yeah, a, a biography by him. I, I went through a whole series of books. I mean, it, interesting. It, I, 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 I like the idea that you, the most productive period you have actually is the point of failure, ironically, because these are the things that you could never do. You always wanted to do, oh, I don't have time. I can't, I can't, like these vacations, I can't do them. They, these cultures, I can never learn them. And now you can. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then you and then you realize, well, guess what? 99% of whatever companies fail. And by the way, they go into bankruptcy, then they come out of bankruptcy, right? How many mm -hmm. times has Toys R Us gone in and out of bankruptcy? Like, I don't even know if we can count that anymore. Like, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's just, a, it's actually a pretty uh, eye-opening thing. And, and so I feel good. But I mean, on the on the point of failure, I I think I uh, appreciate your analogy with Toys R Us. But I think the you know if we ask a lot of people in the crypto community, many would say we, many would say that yes, failure happens and happens all the time. Yeah. But in this case, that uh, many would argue that there was also fall fall play as well. I mean, for example, many many would argue that there was uh, uh, some allegi allegations of fraud, for example, that some of the financials that were being given were potentially false. You know, in that but case, the, the, those are legal, case, Henry. These are legal questions. Like, I mean, th people can say whatever they want, but the reality is, it's actually been closer to two years now since our our bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there's, you know, I, I think at first people were just angry. They were like, oh, send him to jail, send this. But but guess what? There's like no government action anywhere in the world. There's no uh, criminal action anywhere in the world. There is a civil case, which is, I mean, our, our lawyer, I don't follow it as closely, to be honest, but our lawyers tell me it's just like, you know, these all, 90 whatever percent of those, those things just end in settlements. So it's just part of the game. And so like, yeah, like there can be all, I mean, People, the, the most critical people of us when we went down were, guess what, SPF and Barry. And what are they doing right now? So I think I think people are kind of, um, you know, they have a, a different perspective on things, Yeah, actually. Yeah. Would, would, would you have done things differently? I mean, if you want to look back and you have time to reflect, especially over the last couple of months of Three Arrows, uh, yeah. if you had to go back in time, would you have done things differently? 
I mean, there are many things that I would have I would have thought of differently. Like, I think in terms of ethos, if you're looking for like, I don't know, advice for I know you you teach some students yeah. stuff. If you, if you, if I my my biggest advice to people really is uh, always remember what got you where you were. And so for us, um, we were very, very good at uh, understanding arbitrage, understanding edge, understanding talent and being able to bring talent into the firm. And um, and these were things that as you get bigger and more successful and frankly, didn't see a lot of failure, like 10 straight mm -hmm. years of success after success, you know, in large part, um, you start to tell yourself a different story. And, you know, and, and and you forget, actually, oh, the real reason was, you know, we didn't, we weren't successful because we we're really good venture guys, for example. We did venture later on, but for the first eight years of the firm, we didn't do a lot of venture, right? And so, um, so were we good at it or not? I, I mean, some of the, I, arguably, maybe some of them we were actually okay at, but that was really not got, what got us to where we were. And we had forgotten a lot of that. So I think that's the number one thing that I, like, as an ethos, I wish uh, I had I had remembered. And uh, I would definitely advise on other people as well. Um, but yeah, like, in, in, more specifically, in terms of, like, concrete examples, um, at the point of when a company fails, um, you know, it was my first major failure, right? And so for me, I didn't really know how things happened. But if I look at, uh, you know, older businessmen or, or, or women that had have done this over the years, you realize that like almost all companies fail and they all go through liquidations and, or, or, or they go into bankruptcy and then come out of bankruptcy or they uh, get restructured. And I actually, we do, I do, right before this, recorded a, a really interesting episode with Wasi Lawyer, who's a bankruptcy lawyer, very familiar with the crypto space. And we talked a lot about what's missing in crypto and what could be done like broadly across, across you know, a bunch of different firms. And pretty much, I think we're in agreement that um, there was a time in crypto, let's say pre this cycle, where uh, the industry would bail itself out. If you think about like the Gawk situation or the, uh, you know, the Bitfinex situation, those were arguably way worse in terms of like percent of the network and percent of a, a number of co 120,000 coins hacked in Bitfinex. And they, those guys made 20 times their money back, right? Uh, and it was a restructuring deal. Um, this cycle, that did not happen. For whatever reason, maybe the maybe the firms got too big or whatever, but external parties got involved, and for the worse. And it is not it, so. I think, um, yeah. If it, at the point of our uh, business, you know, when, when it went down, um, if we were able to bring in uh, a restructuring expert, like let's say Hulikan and Loki, or industry people that were, uh, we 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 were actually already speaking to uh, CZ approached us. Uh, paradigm approach, Sequoia approached us. All of these could have structured things in a different way. But if we if we had been able to get those conversations going with other creditors, um, you know, we probably would have restructured. We probably would have been fine. A as many, by the way, other funds that were uh, financially worse off than us in the crypto space as they are today, they did restructure. We were just we happen to be bigger, but in terms of uh, you know uh, financial. Um, status or, or uh, balance sheet, you know, th they, they were way, way worse off and they did restructure and we could have done the same. Like, who, we should have like done that. Who, who do you think did a good job in restructuring? Every single one of the uh, firms in Singapore, pretty much all the, uh, so th there was um, uh, Babel Finance, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that was a restructuring. Um, that was led, I believe, primarily by the backers who were VCs, Dragonfly and the like, and then mm -hmm. also the founders. And my understanding is that their balance sheet was way worse than ours, but somehow they made it through a restructuring, they're, you know, and they're moving on, right? And they're creating new business and more opportunity for creditors, which is a good thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. But so I, mean, I, I think there are many examples of this. Yeah. I mean, not to... Uh... You know, I think when I look at some of the examples, you get Mount Gox. I remember when Mount Gox happened. I, like, yeah. I've been in the space for a while. I mean, to be honest, that happened initially. It was a hack. Yes, there was some potential nefarious activity yeah. afterwards. Bitfinex, I mean, was a hack as well. Whereas if you yeah. look at some of the more recent cases or FTX, where it was clearly fraud, it was using customers' assets. 
Uh, so I think there's a bit of difference, though, to be fair, between the, some of the early days where the industry was bailing out. You may even argue the the eat, you know, when the Dow happened and the going back in town with Eat Classic as well, going yeah. back in time. Uh, I mean, the industry kind of saved itself, but often these problems were external problems. They were not uh, problems due to like FTX, where it was clearly uh, uh, use of customer funds, which is which is illegal, right? Again, no. So, I mean, I think I so. That's where, that's happened uh, in the case of that's certainly happened in the case of FTX, and there's been a conviction, and you know he will serve yeah. time, right? Um, in the case of Gox, that was not clear at first. You know, there was yeah. lots of speculation, and then as it turned out, it was it was able to resolve you know, it, it, itself in various ways. And even, um, I think Vijay, I forget his last name, uh, just put out a tweet um, creating the analogy between Gox and, uh, you know, Barry Silver with DCG and um, and said, you know, Karpalas was under a lot of heat, um, but frankly, legally could have kept all the upside because one of the things that happens in a bankruptcy is you get dollarized, right? And he had every right to keep the upside, but he didn't. He, he he gave it, you know, back to creditors and creditors did pretty well. They, they kept the Bitcoin upside, right? Um, in the case of DCG, it appears that Barry's trying to do the opposite, right? Um, and trying to dollarize everyone at like 21K or whatever, and then keep the upside for himself, right? But again, these are not criminal things. These are, these are civil cases and they're just debating about the upside, right? So yeah, like in the case of FTX, there has been a criminal investigation, but um, you know, maybe in the case of Celsius, maybe in the case of uh, BlockFi, I think there was a SEC fi couple fines as well. But outside of those, I mean, th there is none. Like in, in, for for example, you mentioned ours. Ours has none. Uh, you know, DCG is still civil. It's the New York Attorney General, but it's still civil. Um, yeah, so it it is analogous in in many ways. Yeah. No, I understand where your point of view. But like, let's say you mentioned there's no criminal. Uh accusations against 3AC, right? Uh, you mentioned Zero. it's only civil cases right now. So like when, what do you, like for example, when you see uh, Sue, who obviously spent a couple of months yeah. in prison recently, uh, first of all, how was you, what was your reaction when that happened? How did he react when he heard the news or uh, how was it? Like, uh... Um, Well, okay, let's just be clear. He went to prison for missing a court date, which he did not know about, <laughs> right? So um, it, that's quite a bit different. That was a civil uh court date it was uh that you know that we were not aware of i mean if we were aware of we would have gone to the date um and surely him who was in singapore if he was aware of he would have gone because if you don't then you know you, you have these problems right so um so again not criminal um uh civil case but uh but yeah no he he uh at first we were like i wasn't sure what to expect we were trying to you know, support his family and all that kind of stuff but over time, uh, he really embraced it. I mean, he just recorded two episodes uh, about his time there and really made the most of it. Like, again, you don't have the, you don't have the uh, distractions of media. You don't have the distractions of, uh, you know, a, a, lo a lot of things. And you can just focus on mental health, supporting people that are around you that you wouldn't have other otherwise met. And, and reading a lot of books. I think he read the... The New Testament, front to cover, uh, front to back. He read the Quran, front to back. He uh, he really made the most of it. Must have been an interesting uh, experience on that side. You know, you mentioned before, uh, Kyle, that, that I teach universities. It's a bit uh, interesting because I published this year the three AC case study. Actually, the hard like yeah. a business school case study. We're actually with my students, and we did it for the first time. Uh, I published two cases this year. One is on the FTX, uh, you know, the collapse, and the other one is on three AC. The title is called Three Arrows Capital. A crypto hedge fund failure in operational due diligence lessons. And one thing we do with the students actually is go through from, a, from an operational due diligence perspective. If somebody was going to invest in three arrows, what are the things to look for? And as like uh, as part of your due as part of your due diligence, uh, you mentioned before. Obviously, the industry has changed. You know, maybe 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 it has maybe it has maybe it hasn't last twelve to eighteen months. But do you think that um, if you were going to set up three arrows again today, if you had to set up a new fund? Would you know what happened? Could it could still happen, or you think there's enough safeguards, better increase enhanced due diligence now, uh, more checks and balances that make such like uh, let's say risk management uh, it's called events less likely? So, so I, I I think the framing of your course is 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 spot on. Like the reality is, uh, we were an institution, right? Three hours was an institution, 
and it only faced institutional counterparties, no retail. Um, and so when someone performs due diligence on a, a, as a lender, because we didn't, I think you framed the course as a fund to fund. We didn't have fund to fund investors, but we did have lenders. And when an institution evaluates a firm, they need to decide what kind of due diligence they want to do, right? And right now they might do very, very stringent due diligence. So it's unlikely we're going to see an OTC credit bubble like we did before. Um, but at that time, you have to remember their incentives. Their incentives were uh, that they were pumping up their own equity valuations. BlockFi just valued at a $3.5 billion round, right? Second of all, they have no real business. Like their only business is to borrow money from retail and then lend it out. So even after they get fined by the SEC for $100 million and settle it, they continue. They keep doing the same thing, right? Because they need, they, they're they trying to go for the higher and higher valuations, right? And um, and also there's there's this uh, uh, an, another incentive where you don't want to lend to 20 different firms and then have one blow up because if you have one of your, you know, your borrowers default on you, that would reflect very poorly on your business. So what you end up doing or what they end up doing, they end up lending everything to like two firms, Alameda and Three Arrows. <laughs> and, uh, and then even after Three Arrows, they end up leaving all of their funds on FTX, right? So yeah. there's this huge, um, it's, I, I, I like to think of, or I, I don't like to, I, I do think of the 22 bubble as a neobanking boom bust cycle, actually, where um, there were a lot of firms that were competing to lend out funds um, where they were kind of running around as like neobanks, borrowing from retail, and then and then lending it out to institutions, right? So, um, so when you when your students, I'm sure, are going through the process and saying like, well, what if, what about? Did you check this? Did you check that? Did you? Check? The answer was no. They probably checked none of that because they had to lend the funds out. That was their entire business, or else their valuations would have gone to zero, right? So, so yeah, that I I don't think that's going to happen again. I think there is a credit bubble that happens in crypto every four years. Um, it will definitely be another one, I think, but it will definitely be different. It will not be the same thing. Were you ever shocked of, of how little due diligence was taking place in the industry? I mean, people, let's say, even lending to you guys, uh, or even subsequently, I mean, you mentioned the, the uh, incidents with BlockFi, or even you mentioned due diligence with uh, FTX, where months and months of due diligence was done by some of the biggest, more sophisticated investors, and nothing was fine. Not nothing was found, or no, no red flags were raised, at least from what we know publicly. In the when you guys were borrowing from these platforms, right? Uh, yeah. Were you surprised at how easily you're able to borrow back in the day? Um, okay, it was a product of the time. So there, there, were, there, were, there were many things that were surprising, you know, in retrospect, in terms of valuations and all sorts of stuff, right? Um, but if you if I look at Three Arrows, the top three lenders are like 70% of the entire lending pool. So it's not a question of, I think the, the total list might be 80 or something like that, but it's a really, really concentrated in the top three, specifically the top one, but really the top three comprise almost, you know, more than two thirds of the book, right? And the number one was Genesis, which also their sister company was Grayscale. And so in terms of the due diligence, the, okay, maybe they weren't checking risk procedures and things like that, but they had the collateral. They knew the trade. They were the ones that pitched us the trade. That said, you should, you know, subscribe to these grayscale shares, post them with us, and we will lend you to do so. So, and they held that collateral. So there was no question of, you know, risk and this and this. Like they, they're like, we invented this trade. Like we, <laughs> you know, I think the only reason that they needed uh, other people to do it is because it would be a huge conflict of interest if they were twenty percent of the entire trade. Right? They needed other firms to do five percent. 8%, whatever. And it turns out we were the biggest one besides them. Uh, but, um, but yeah, like they, they were, they, they were very much incentivized to keep this trade going as long as possible, because if it did not, if it crashed and we got liquidated, the shares would also get liquidated and, or they would have to take them on. And that would be very problematic for their whole business. Right. So um, yeah. Interesting. One last question on this topic, actually, then I want to talk about something else. But like, you know, Luna, of course, you know, actually, when we do, yeah. we do the case, when I do the case with my students, you know, often uh, as part of the discussion, often it starts at how the Luna 
events, especially the, with, with UST and everything going on at the time on, on the Anchor Protocol, really kind of fueled the demise of 3AC in a way. What's your view on that? I mean, the the the, the whole uh, Luna uh, Terra ecosystem mm-hmm. that we've had, and when you're talking about a crazy valuations and you know these, these cycles, when you look back and you think about the whole Terra and Luna ecosystem, what's your view on that? Like, are you surprised at what happened? Uh, would you have done things differently? Uh, no, I wouldn't have done things differently. Um, <laughs> and yes, I thought. Um, okay, so first of all, just to set the scene here. We were an investor in Luna uh, in the LFG round, which raised a billion dollars. We were about 200 million of that. And uh, we didn't really participate in the stablecoin side, their UST. Um, and so uh, our coins were locked for four years. And um, and that was the round that we did. So uh, so when it started to collapse, there was no option for us to like sell. The coins were locked, right? And uh, in fact, we couldn't even really hedge because the derivatives market for Luna was very small. Like we would have been able to hedge only a fraction. So we didn't really, we kind of were just sitting it out and watching from the sidelines some of the talks about bailouts. But if I think about what could have, maybe a more interesting question would be like, what could have uh, happened uh, differently and, and, and made it more successful? Um, Luna's probably biggest problem is it didn't have a stop button. Uh, when you have any kind of crisis, I now very much recognize what, what helps is if you have a stop button where you can then remove yourself, have calls with investors, creditors, whatever, and try to come up with some sort of restructuring. And there's usually either a debt to equity conversion, a new token strategy, a new investment, uh, or an equity cap table change, something. There's a, there's kind of only a couple variables that come into play, which um, you know, extend the amount of time. And, and, and we're fortunate to be in an industry where every four years, that seems to just keep going up only, right? So if you think about the case of Gox or the case of Bitfinex, they just waited long enough that the thing went up. So everyone made multiples of their money, right? It looks like Barry's doing the same thing. He was pretty good about like kicking the can down the road to the point that out now everyone's basically doing civil suits for the upside, right? So in the case of Luna, programmatically, they could not have that stop button. And so what ended up happening is on the first day of the DPEG, um, oh, one other thing to set the scene, it had been bailed out in the past before by jump uh, a couple times. And so people were accustomed to the idea that it could be bailed out, which is, I, I think if you were to think about the entire system, I could point to multiple times where there was a bailout and that specific instance is what people were expecting the second time and that's why it did. And, and Luna very much had that too. And so, um, you know, Binance had a very serious uh, offer. There was also uh, a, a group of investors that came in with a very serious offer. But as this protocol is infinite, you know, infinitely printing uh, Luna tokens, um, it's creating this death spiral where there's no, you know, it just gets worse and worse and worse every second that you wait. Um, and so, I think, yeah, if if Doe was able to just accept the first deal, maybe it would have been okay. If he was able to pause it, he would have had a lot of time and he probably would have been able to come up with a solution. Um, but because this was DeFi and he had no back door and he, you know, and he waited too long, uh, it really spiraled out of control very quickly. It was a matter of days. What's what's a message if 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 you had one message to Doe right now to Do, Do, Do Kwan, what would it be? To Doe? Um so I mean we're still in touch with him by the way. I think I, okay. I, we'll see we'll see what happens but um yeah I think my my, my view in general of Terra is that um tech, people need to be able to build technology and it needs to be able to fail sometimes. And the only question is did he intend for it to fail? Did he profit from it knowing that it would fail later or did he uh commit fraud? Did he lie about certain transactions that were happening? Those are the questions that if he goes to, you know, if he gets persecu- uh, prosecuted and they, they, they determine are true, will we'll determine how, how much, you know, criminal activity there was or not. Um, but it, let's assume, just for the sake of argument, that he was not aware of, uh, uh, of that. And he genuinely built a, you know, huge technology platform that then blew up. That That's okay. 
like that that's a, the, the world should be able to do that right and 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 so um so these are the questions that i think he's going to have to go through i know he's yeah. he's still in montenegro it's still a question of where he's going to go i know there was a headline he's going to the us he's not going to the us he, they, he's still going to appeal that and it'll be years before he goes there or here or wherever right um but uh but yeah it'll be very interesting to see how how that unfolds Interesting, interesting perspective. Like, I want to talk about also what you're doing now with Ox.Fund. But before that, obviously, the yep. on Ox. That, 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 uh, that fund, which is your new project, uh, you guys are using Ox token, which was obviously in as, as part of Open uh, OpenX, which is your previous project you're working on uh, post uh, 3AC. Just ke keen to get your like uh, your views on that. I mean, uh, you know, obviously, it didn't end. You know, you guys had to shut that down on uh, on February fourteenth, uh, two thousand twenty four. Like, how was uh, when you look back? At, when you look back at OpenX, what's your what would have what, what would you have done differently to ask the same question on this project uh, that you probably would not do again yeah. in uh, Oxstat Fund? So, j just to be clear here, Sue and I are advisors to okay. OpenX and to Ox Fund. Uh, OpenX was a seventy five person team run by Mark Lamb, yep. right? Uh, and then the CEO was his wife, Leslie Lamb. And so, um, yeah, they, the, we had a lot of, uh, you know, good ideas, I think, uh, there, the, 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 the gist of it was that, um, due to all of these crypto bankruptcies, uh, people would benefit from being able to tokenize their claim, being able to get liquidity on it, sell it, or use it as collateral to trade, which is what a lot of them wanted to do in the first place. And I think the, the the bird's eye view of that is still a good idea. I think the execution of that is tricky because uh, for one, uh, claims are not all the same. Uh, so to make them fungible in a tokenized way is tricky. There are ways that you can think about it, but that's one problem to solve. And then the other problem to solve is that uh, there are relatively few buyers that don't want to trade on your platform, that just want to just basically own the claims, right? And those are large debt firms. Um, and so putting those pieces together um, is definitely possible, uh, but it's just a question of how big you want to go, right? So one of the funny things is when, when I was in Dubai, I think around the time that I met you, we met uh, another good friend um, who was uh, uh, who we told this idea to, and he went off and built it in his own way. And he's now got the number one claims exchange for FTX claims. And it turns out it's a very small business model. Um, he just is matching buyers and sellers. And, you know, he, he's got some Twitter handles. He'll DM people. He'll try to get them on his platform. And he's, you know, nailed the market. But it just turns out the way he's done it is probably not, you know, it's not. It's just not a huge thing, right? Whereas we were, the original ambitions were to uh, become FTX 2.0. It was almost to do a... Uh, vampire tap on FTX and get all of that collateral onto your platform, then be able to run that and then become, you know, one of the busy, biggest exchanges, which would benefit all the users as well. And that vision did not materialize. So OpenX decided to shut down. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's uh, it's interesting you mentioned that. There's one question I've always wondered, Kyle, and uh, I don't know if you can answer it, but obviously there's in Dubai, there's obviously a massive growing crypto ecosystem, as, as, you, yeah. as uh, you know very well. Uh, arguably, it's become now the, the, the global crypto hub when it comes to companies setting up and being regulated and, and the ecosystem being built. Um, you, you guys were one of the firms that got a fine from, uh, from Vara, actually, probably, probably one of the first ones, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. One thing I never understood is why didn't you guys, you know, when you read the uh, the, the regulator's announcement on it, it says that obviously they ask you not to launch the platform and they, you know, the regulator and their notice, Vara, to their to their credit, really details uh, how they, they made a regulatory action and notice against you guys. And they said, you know, do not launch this platform. And they warned you again. And you guys still, uh, and I know you guys were an advisor to the firm. You mentioned you're not founders, but you're an advisor to the firm. What was your... Uh, when you look back at it, do you think it was a mistake? Like, do you think you should have been a bit more careful on that perspective, or it yeah, wasn't? I mean, really... it's. I I think uh, I I agree with you that Dubai is a hub for crypto, but it, it, I would totally disagree with you that it is the hub for crypto. Um, Asia is the hub for crypto. Um, so yeah, it, I I think if the operators of OpenX could do it again, they probably would have um, mm -hmm. either sought out another regulatory body or they would have just launched in asia frankly but um but yeah like i i, I mean 
we were we were surprised by that one. Yeah, for sure. And you're you're very bullish on Asia when it comes to crypto. You think that's where Asia, the Asia is the hub. Yeah, yeah, it it, it's it's not a question. Um, Asia is very. It, if you just look at volumes, if you look at derivatives, if you look at um, it, it, it's it, Asia is uh, was and and will be the the hub for crypto. Um, the U.S. kind of has its own thing going with the ETF, and it's really good at some like more protocol development kinds of things. You know, Israel also very good at protocol development. Um, but frankly, like if you look at usage, uh, you know, and money going into it and retail and that kind of, it, 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 it's, it's just Asia. Like, uh, I don't know. I, I can look down the segment, for example, of the user base of, uh, Ox.Fun, for example, or, yep. you know, I, I, any of these platforms. And, uh, yeah, I can just tell you that, um, uh, it, it's, it's Asia. Yeah, even even I would argue a lot a lot of the big players now globally, not only in everywhere, it's, it's uh, have a root in Asia somewhere as well, even from where they started as well. Let's keep yeah, I mean, more yeah, Kyle, a bit more about what you're working on right now. So obviously yeah. putting uh, OpenX behind and travels behind. So you you you're an advisor now uh, to something called Ox.fun. Can you maybe share with our, with our audience yep. what it is and what does the platform do? For sure. So Ox.fun is uh, a gamified derivatives platform, which accepts the AUX token as collateral and as AUX p and um, But it's supposed to be a reimagined uh, version of the best gamified exchange. And so um, the idea is that if you close a winning cha- trade, you get AUX, obviously, right? As any other exchange, you know, you, you would earn positive p But if you close a losing trade, you also get a token. It's called milk. And um, and so you never walk away empty handed. You win on the upside or you get milk on the downside. And there's um, and there's also way, uh, a, a way to stake the a pool where you can earn the trading fees. That will be a, live in a, a couple of weeks. Um, and not only that, but you can even get a to- even after you've staked, you get a token back, which allows you to use as collateral on exchange. So in that sense, you're earning the trading fees while you're also being able to trade on the exchange, which is another kind of gamified innovation that um, Ox.Fun has done. So I think there's going to be a lot of things where we're, you know, the team, uh, we're advisors, but the team is trying to, um, you know, make users feel more included and then also give users the liquidity and opportunity to try to, to try to do well try this bull market it's the beginning of a bull market now we can't be uh can't be talking about bankruptcies all day long anymore we got to be talking about the next uh the next big thing so because to make sure i understand properly uh kyle before this podcast i went and i look at the platform and did my research a bit but so yep. just to make sure for my audience so everybody's on the same page so basically obviously the collateral you're using to trading this crypto derivatives right the collateral that you're posting to trade these crypto derivatives is the ox token uh, right. They're obviously then trading these perpetual swap derivatives, intr- derivative instruments that are USD denominated, but the PNL, let's say you make money out of it, out of a trade, uh, is paid an AUX token. But uh, of right. course, if you're losing trade, you're getting this. You said milk token, right? Milk, you milk get a milk token. token. But yes, yes. So, so the 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 and that's what it is. Uh, and then, uh, can you share maybe also with our audience uh, the nature? I mean, is it is it more is it is a DeFi platform that we have there? Like, it's, it's is it custodial, non custodial? It's centralized. It's, it's a mix of all of the above. Um, okay. It's a CD. It's a hybrid CD DeFi, but okay. it's um, and so what it means is basically the way you connect to it, the way that custody is done, the way that trading is done, um, is still a little bit of a mix. I mean, obviously, we would like to err more towards the decentralized solutions. Um, but a lot of the infrastructure is not in place for all of that, or it has trade-offs, which are in our view, not worth it. Right. Um, so, uh, for example, central order book matching, I don't think is done well in an order book, uh, in any centralized, any decentralized exchange. I mean, the, 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 the prevailing kind of DeFi, plat- oops, the DeFi platforms, uh, still use for the most part, centralized order books. Right. Um, and I think that's just a product of um, user experience, right? Because at the end of the day, you need to make a product that people want to use and it needs to be um, comparable to what they would get in other experiences if they were to trade other derivatives. So so yeah, this is the current iteration of the platform. 
the next month roadmap basically is being able to accept other kinds of collateral. So not just docs, but other kinds of collateral um, mm -hmm. and uh, being able to do copy trading. Sue and I will do a competition with each other where we battle it out on the uh, in public. You can watch our positions and make fun of us or whatever you want to do. Um, but that'll be fun. And um, and yeah. And then the house fault. Yeah. Because there's been, there been a couple of attempts at creating, you know, mixing, uh, you know, for crypto derivatives. Obviously, there's an old centralized ecosystem that exists from what BitMEX created years ago to Binance and others who have obviously yep. centralized uh, derivative uh, exchanges. On the other hand, you have a fully DeFi uh, derivative exchanges. DYDEX is a very good example. We actually had uh, Charles, uh, the president of the foundation on the show recently as well. And in between, you know, there's been always examples of people have tried to mix uh, both, you know, uh, um, Bullish is a good example that comes to mind. Who also been on the show recently, yeah. uh, talking to combine the the you know with the order book, but obviously using uh, AM pools on that side. Where do you see uh, Ox .fun, uh, the Fund, the Ox Fund fall in this? Well, uh, you you mentioned DYDX. Is that DeFi here? Yeah. Uh, I think we would argue that yeah, DYDX is a DeFi decentralized exchange for. Why? Why, uh, why would you argue that? Why they, like in terms of their order book matching? Why would you argue that's decentralized? Uh, but I would no. You're right. I think from the order book matching is one thing, but also the fact that they do not hold custody of assets as well. I think which is what you guys are trying to do, right? You you plug in your wallet and you're able to to trade, right? Yeah. So a, uh, the, for not, sure, not we're custodial. we're it's still custodial right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. it would be nice to move in the direction of not being able to you know to or being able to hold non custodially. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, yeah, I think there are, I think there's trade offs amongst everything. I think the reality is if you put literally the whole thing on chain um the user experience is just so bad that you i don't even know if we can name a derivative platform that does that and i think in the last bull run i invested in like eight of these so <laughs> literally all the perp derivative platforms including dydx and a bunch that you probably never even heard of because they you know didn't they didn't materialize right in various ways and so yeah everyone's playing along the spectrum um i think the uh yeah basically this is the iteration we're going with for now. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think basically plan to compete with uh, mechanisms um, such as that, you know, the house vault idea where you can stake, earn fees, trading fees on the exchange and be able to, you know, use that collateral to still trade with as well. Um, and um, as well as, you know, the, uh, you know, kind of ox perp design that, that, that we went with. Yeah, so it was interesting because when I looked at some of the the material you guys have on on your site, for example, uh, I mean, you mentioned there's two hundred percent APY. There's obviously yep. uh, you know some interesting uh, uh, even sense of humor, I have to say, on some of the the pages of the document as well. But like it's um, you know one of the things when I look at it, and you mentioned we before we talk about Luna uh, previously, we we're talking about Luna, for example, right? Yep. Here, your 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 PNL, your perps are the PNL is in US dollar, but the it's paid off in aux token, right? Yep. Don't you think there is the same risk that we've had back in the day with Luna, where obviously it was a no. I know you guys were not involved with stable coin, but there was a no. US dollar peg. But uh, when the value of the coin Luna fell, uh, everything the 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 uh, the, the debt that, spiral, like the term you used before, happened. Uh, actually, I'm glad you brought this up because that is specifically what this guards against. Um, the whole concept here is that, um, the platform is always solvent, uh, pr provided there's no like, you know, hacks or things like that. But in terms of the aux price fluctuations, the platform is always solvent because it's like you're playing a game where everyone agrees to play the game in one token. Um, if you were to play that game in dollars, then everyone would, you know, there'd be winners and losers, but at the end of the day, there, there's a certain amount of dollars that went in, a certain amount of dollars that come out. Same thing here. A certain amount of ox that comes in, a certain amount of ox that comes out. Um, and um, the only question is how many people are playing the game, basically, right? Like, and if more people play the game, in general, the price of uh, the token versus dollars may go up. So that's that's the thinking. Like, I, I mean, how would you design a platform such that more people would join the game, right? Um, and, uh, but but at the same time, knowing that the platform is always solvent. The problem with having Tether PL, like you, you were suggesting, is um, first of all, market making. 
you need market makers to always be hedging that risk because let's say there's a winner on the platform. Um, let's say there, you, you know, you bet the market's going up. I bet the market's going down. The market goes up. You now want to withdraw your tether. Someone like I, someone needs to have either deposited tether or the market maker needs to be hedging such that they can pay you out. But in the case here, there is always a, a payout uh, because it's an ox, right? And I and and we know that there's. Um, we know that there's enough ox, basically. There, there, for example, the market maker does not need to hedge anything. They can be they can be trading. They can choose to hedge if they want to hedge or not, but they do not need to because um, because the PL is an ox, effectively, right? That's why the liquidity. I, I, I don't know if you noticed on the platform is quite good actually for uh, you know for a one month old platform. Um, I think you know if you look at any kind of depth, it's similar to Binance USDC perp markets, for example. Um, so very good liquidity. Uh, and yeah, go ahead. Okay. But I'm interested, maybe, maybe I, I don't understand the mechanism of the platform very well, Akash, so apologies for that. But I mean, I get, I, I'm trying trouble understanding how the platform can always be solvent because if there's aux tokens, I get it, right? The panel's been aux and you always, yep. you obviously you have as much aux as you want, but then that's a bit the same logic as Luna as well. I mean, you, the value of those aux tokens will go down. I mean, the, the, the collateral people are posting, as margin, then will obviously decrease it. There will be margin costs. I'm trying to trying to understand how the platform can always be solvent. Uh, uh, okay, uh, and it, it eliminates a Luna risk. Okay, just to be clear, Luna Luna can also be always solvent, right? Um, that's what creates the the, the, the mechanism, right? Um, but second of all, um, so your the main question is, I think we can agree that it, it is always solvent in Ox, right? Um, oh, correct. Right. Um, but then the question is, how can you avoid cascading liquidations? Right. And uh, the main answer to that is, if there were to, you pay people in more ox. Right. No one needs to uh, like. At the end of the day, if people if everyone wants to cash out ox and sell ox, then, yes, it can go down to zero. That's true of with Ethereum, too, by the way. Or Bitcoin. If everyone wants to sell their Bitcoin, Bitcoin goes to zero. There's no buyer, right? Um, the, the only question is, how do you have a system such that people want to keep playing, right? And want to keep holding because there's transaction fees or whatever else. Uh, in the case of Luna, it's, it's, it's different. People forget, by the way, with Luna, it lasted longer as a uh, Luna token than it did as a Luna plus USDT token, a UST token. Uh, it, was, it only had a stablecoin component for um, for the past couple of years, right? Um, before that, it was just a it was just an it was just another you know protocol token, right? And um, and it's specifically that two token you know model which uh, guarantees the uh, solvency of a dollar peg. Ours does not guarantee, so Ox does not guarantee the solvency of a dollar peg. It guarantees the solvency of an Ox platform. Thus, there's no there's no concept of a debt spiral. There's, yeah, but, Ox can go up, Ox can go down, if more people join, if more people lose, but there's no concept of uh, we need to maintain a dollar peg and thus it can spiral to zero, which is what happened in the case of Loon. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I would just argue, I mean, to be, to be the devil's advocate, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like you mentioned Bitcoin or Luna. I mean, I even argue that Luna had a massive ecosystem as well. Massive, maybe it's a generous term, but they had a broader ecosystem. Yeah. And same Bitcoin. I mean, there's other uses people have when they're posting Bitcoin as collateral to the, the, the derivative exchanges uh, than just as collateral to those exchanges. Whereas, um, uh, it, I mean, I don't I don't know well what the uh, use cases for Ox token are outside of the platform, but I think there's that's the risk that I can see, and there, especially if the PNL is paid in is the dollar PNL. Yes, we can print. There's no dollar rating. PNL. There's no dollar PNL. It's Ox PNL, and so okay. it, it it's like if you were to um like if we were to play a a, a card game, okay, and we agreed to play in you know, in aux tokens or whatever, um, if the aux token went to 10,000 per aux, then that would be a pretty expensive game that we were playing. But if it goes to a dollar per aux, then it would be a much smaller game that we were playing. It doesn't matter. The game's still solvent. Like, it, you know, it goes up, it goes down. It, the game's, And there's no death spiral either. Like, if you cash out of the game, there, there's no, like... Um, but 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 just, 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 just since you mentioned it, there is another case for aux. Um, 
Uh, there is a, um, a separate company called Ox Cash, which uh, has a Bank of Spain license to operate ATMs. And so there are 10 ATMs. You can go to Madrid, you can go to Barcelona, you can use your Ox token, get discounts and go use a Bitcoin ATM over there if you want. Um, so that was kind of a fun one, but uh, not a core business really. Just kind of a fun one that just happened, happened, why, why not? Um, and, uh, but, but yeah, like it, it my, my only point, point is there's no concept of a death spiral for, for, for uh, Ox fund. It's just, it's just a game that people play and decide to nominate an Ox. And why a crypto der derivatives exchange? I mean, there's so many crypto yeah. businesses or platforms that can be launched. Why crypto derivatives? Is there a particular reason? Are you bullish, you know, on it? Uh, or is there a particular reason you decided to launch uh, Ox.Fun in the space? Well, uh, so I was the largest trader on FTX, for one. I was like number one on their leaderboard for pretty much the whole life of FTX. And before that, I was the, no the number one open interest on OKX and Huobi when we moved our business over. And I just happen to know derivatives pretty well. And so um, same, I mean, Sue and I, you know, previously traded uh, uh, FX derivatives, right? We were the, we were the I think the largest trading firm doing uh, uh, non-deliverable forwards, which is if you want to trade India, China, Korea, Taiwan, any of the non-deliverable currencies, currencies where you can't just freely walk across the border, but they trade in a forwards market. We were trading 10 to 15% of the, of the global market uh, in terms of volumes for like seven years. In that kind of stuff. And so um, we're also on the derivatives board of KRX and Korea and, uh, and um, uh, you know, we're very involved in SGX and Singapore and, uh, and basically all the FX derivatives. So we, when we thought about what we wanted to do, what we were going to think about, um, you know, there are a lot of people doing AI kind of coins and, and other kind of stuff. Like, I don't, I just don't know that much about AI. I'd have to learn a lot about it. But I happen to know a lot about derivatives, and so um, and so we thought that this would make the most sense. So yeah, and we have a, we I don't know maybe our the, one of the big critiques people have given us is it's just a small idea like how you know why don't you just work on the next uh, you know Ethereum killer then 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 you can be talking decabillion dollar valuations, and the reality is like I don't know how to program so <laughs> I'm not going to get very far. Um, but uh, but I do happen to know a lot about crypto derivatives trading, and so it would probably better value that I can, I can. And there. what's your view on crypto markets, uh, Kyle? Obviously when you look at the, uh, let's say the rest of 2024 and the months ahead, uh, are you bullish on where markets are heading? Uh, very bullish. Yeah. It's giving me, uh, you know, late 2019, early 2020 vibes. Um, I think that there's, that's not to say there won't be pullbacks, not to say there won't, but like the, if you think of late 19, 2019, early 2020, it was all about the grayscale art, which was at a premium, and it was all about futures basis. And that's kind of what pulled us in. And now people are very much, in, you know, looking at the uh, grayscale uh, ETF inflows. And they're also looking at, um, you know, potentially the, the uh, Ethereum ETFs. And it's it's also once there's one ETF that kind of the whole world follows, follows these things as well, right? So, um, so I think there's plenty of... Uh, uh, tailwinds there. Uh, I also think that you're starting to see froth already <laughs> in terms of some of like the low float coins. Um, not to say that they're bad projects, but they definitely need like WorldCoin is worth almost more than OpenAI now, I think, right? It's like $80 billion market cap, 1% float. Uh, very good for the three arrows estate, by the way. We're, uh, I think, a top four holder of that. Um, and uh, Starkware as well. Again, similar games. What, $25 billion valuation or something like 20 billion, something like that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, those, that, those guys definitely need to grow on those valuations. But that said, I still believe we're, we're, we're very early in the cycle. I don't see the signs, uh, you know, Coinbase, uh, you know, uh, downloads, app downloads are nowhere near cycle tops. Um, if you look at any of the other altcoin cycle stuff, they're, they're, we're nowhere near the cycle top. So I, I, I think we're early. That's a very, very bullish of you, uh, Kyle, on that side. Uh, you know, as we're coming to the end of the show, I mean, one other question is, like, you know, um, I know when a lot of my follower, my listeners listen to this, they say, you know what, okay, we've seen Kyle at 3AC, we've seen what, uh, when yeah. it, what it was in OpenX. Why should we trust him this time? 
why should we try trust Kyle and, and Sue in this new venture uh, with uh, everything that happened the last uh, couple of uh, two to three years? Like, what would be your message to them? Um. Well, okay. I would say three. First of all, three hours was a ten-year fund, right? I mean, I think it was probably one of the best performing hedge funds of all time, right? Traded like a million dollars into like however many billions, depending on how you mark it, right? Um, and so um, we definitely learned a lot about bankruptcy cycles, um, what happens on the downside. Um, and we definitely have a lot of ideas about what, you know, the industry can do better, what we can do better, you know, and, and, and more on the upside as well. But yeah, I mean, I, frankly, we could have left the industry. We could have just decided to read books, to meditate, we, but, but we're not, we're out here fighting. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I've, I've been inspired by many people, but uh, I, I'm hoping that uh, that people will see that, you know, you, life is long and uh, and you, you, you're going to have failures. Some will be small, some will be big. But uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger says you got to you got to keep fighting. He's he's seen a lot. of He's got a great documentary. I loved his documentary on Netflix. Um, and yeah, he's like, he's like, you, you just got to be active and you just got to keep going and people are going to say this, they're going to say that, but yeah, like if you follow society all day long, every hundred years, you're going to be a Nazi. That's the reality, right? <laughs> um, you've got to, uh, you can't follow society all day long. You've got to do what you are good at, what you believe in. And, um, and you'll, and you'll do well by that. And I think, and I think people will, people will vibe with that. Interesting uh, that I mean you've you've been it was uh, it's been interesting year and I think uh, whether you, whether for the it's good thing or a bad thing I don't know but definitely I think in the history of crypto assets and digital assets uh, three arrows and uh, definitely <laughs> has played a big role uh, and uh, you know I think there's been a lot of a lot of a lot of things that happened following three C that actually uh, yeah. the were tough to be fair as for the industry. Uh, but um, it was interesting to hear your thoughts on on all this, uh, Kyle. Uh, Kyle, I know this was the first interview you were giving one on one uh, for over a year, so we really thank you on behalf of the, uh, you know, my audience uh, that at least we're able to hear from you and uh, share some uh, for you to share some of your thoughts. Any closing remarks? Anything you want people to hear about what you're doing that you think the uh, I didn't ask in this interview? I uh, I mean. I, I think my main message to people would be, I think this is the beginning of a cycle. I don't know what your audience thinks, but if it is the beginning of a cycle, get out there, be active. Um, I, I mean, if you have interest in Ox Fund, you can ping me, you can ping Sue or anyone else on the, on the, on the team. Um, but if, if you have interest in other stuff, you should just be active. This is the way you get, you get early. And I can tell you from last cycle, there were numerous kids out there that turned like 50K into hundreds of millions of dollars Several of them worked for us, <laughs> um, and um, and I, I this was a story that we saw over and over. And that the, the main differentiator was people that were just hungry and active. And I think it will be the same this cycle too. Interesting, Kyle. I have a little tradition. Anybody comes to my show, it's my my bell is with me. I ask quick questions, and I need one or two word answers. And the bell is here to uh, keep us honest. Uh, you ready for it? Hit me. Uh, Kyle, you mentioned uh, you spent some time in Japan. What is your favorite thing to do in Japan? Sushi. Eat, eat sushi. Sam Bankman-Fried from FTX gives you a call. What is the one thing you tell him? Say, mate, you got to reform part of this industry to get it back. But uh, I think I think he's a smart guy. I, I honestly think he's a really smart guy and he can provide a lot of value. Um, my only question is going to be like, how is the world going to allow that soon? Or is he going to have to, is he going to have to provide that value later? But he, I, I think he can. What is the one thing you like the most about the crypto industry? I like that you can have an idea, you can bring an, I, an idea from inception to business, to funding, to growth, uh, faster than any other industry in the world. And that that can be a good thing sometimes. That can be a bad thing sometimes. But it's uh, it's definitely uh, a fast paced industry. If there's one thing you can tell to your three uh, C creditors, what would it be? 
I'd say get out there. First of all, get on the ox train. We've got a number of people that are already there that are already doing well. Second thing is get out there. It's been two years. Like, uh, you know, we, we, we lost more money than anyone else. Um, and, uh, and it's a bull market. No more bankruptcy talk. Let's go bull market. Uh, you mentioned you're a fan of Ernest Hemingway. If you could have uh, a, cat, a coffee with Ernest Hemingway, what would you ask him? Um, I would ask him about his, uh, his experience in war. He was a war correspondent in many wars. Um, and he himself was even filled with shrapnel. His first book is, is when he was filled with, he was volunteering in World War One. gets filled with shrapnel and, uh, and then it goes and, and, and falls in love with his nurse, right? That's a uh, uh, farewell to arms. And I would ask him what drew him so much to war and what he's learned from it. Like, why does he keep going back to war? <laughs> Another one, uh, Kyle, what current crypto CEO do you admire the most? Current crypto CEO of a crypto firm? Uh, I mean, there's quite a few, to be honest. I, I've always admired CZ. I, I think he's, one of the things that CZ's told us is he's been through like four or five failures. Like, it, it, same thing with the, the CEO of uh, Circle too. He, he's also been, there, like his previous business blew up massively, right? So I think this is something that people don't realize. Like, I, I think retail wants to believe that like failing is like illegal or whatever, right? But the reality is like, if you look at like some of your biggest heroes, they failed a lot and they uh, and they learn from it and they get bigger and they get better and they help people. And, they, and, and so, yeah, that's something that I've, like CZ obviously going through a really rough time right now, still got a big firm, but obviously going through a rough time. I, I think he's going to come out of it. I think he's going to be stronger. I would love to hear his thoughts you know, if he can tell me someday after that, like, where his head is at, what he's thinking. And the last, qu last question, Kyle, uh, Kyle Davis, uh, former uh, co-founder of Three Hours Capital. Kyle, uh, this is the typical question anybody comes on my show. If you could have lunch or dinner with one person dead or alive, lunch or dinner with one person dead or alive, who would you have lunch or dinner with? Right. Um, well, it's got to be someone spiritual. Or it's, you know what? No, it doesn't. It has to be uh, uh, Mori Motonari. He was, oh, he was the um, uh, founder of modern Japan. He had three sons and that's what Three Arrows was named after. And he unified uh, Japan, but he had the Bushido warrior spirit. And I would, uh, yeah, if I, if I could understand his motivations and how he thought about life. I've always been, I've always been drawn to the, to the warrior mentality. Interesting. Actually in the, in the business school case study that I, that we wrote uh, that I teach my students, I actually mentioned that, that that's what her name three hours comes from. So mm. here we go. Very, very interesting. Kyle, thank you for being with us. Thank you for this interview. And hopefully this was insightful for the audience uh, guys. Uh, hope you enjoyed the special episode of the, the feature money podcast. Uh, and hope it was insightful. Uh, see you all soon for another episode of the Future of Money podcast. And thank you very much, Kyle, for being with us uh, today. Mm -hmm.